Nazmina Ahmed Sheikh. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I would like to move the relevant amendments on the order paper tabled in my name and those of my honourable and right honourable colleagues. And I'd like to take members of the House back to the 24th of June when the then Prime Minister, the then Chancellor and now Foreign Secretary were absolutely missing in inaction when the First Minister of Scotland actually took to the steps of Butte House and addressed the people of Scotland on that morning. Let's be clear that we absolutely respect how the people of England and Wales voted in the EU referendum and we ask in turn that the way the people of Scotland and Northern Ireland be equally respected. Madam Deputy Speaker, 40 hours after assuming office, the Prime Minister travelled to Scotland to meet with the First Minister. Ahead of her visit, the Prime Minister directly addressed the people of Scotland, stating, The government I lead will always be on your side. Every decision we take, every policy we take forward, we will stand up for you and your family, not the rich, the mighty or powerful. And that's because I believe in a union, not just between the nations of the United Kingdom, but between all of our citizens. Now, that's what she said then, Madam Deputy Speaker. But if I turn your attention to page three of what could only really be described as an executive summary as opposed to a white paper, <laughs> she refers to one nation. That Members across this House would do well to understand that as long as the Prime Minister and the government continue to believe that this is one nation, they are going to get, make no progress whatsoever in the relationships with the rest of the United Kingdom. Here, here, we are not here, one nation. We are a union of nations, and that is what they need to remember. Yes, of course. Okay, I can't just say I've never done before. I've got a quote uh, an adventure from the Daily Telegraph of the 15th July last year. Theresa May has indicated that she will not trigger the formal process for leaving the European Union until there is an agreed UK approach backed by Scotland. What does the lady think has happened to that commitment from the Prime Minister? I'm very grateful to the right honourable member for Gordon for his intervention. And interestingly, uh, if you were to turn to page 17 of this so-called white paper, you'll see a change in the wording where we've moved from having a UK approach to seeking to agree a UK approach. Another change in position from the Prime Minister. Now, yes, of course. And on that basis, is my honourable friend surprised, therefore, that the UK government now seems willing to seek separate deals, not for Scotland or for Northern Ireland, but for the car industry in London, uh, in Sunderland, and for the City of London? Yeah, yeah. Indeed, grateful to my honourable friend for that, and I'm, I'm going to move on to that issue um, in just a moment. A UK approach for all of Team UK, which is what the Prime Minister would like to think we are are what the SNP compromise amendments propose. And I say they are a compromise because that's exactly what we are, what they are. We fundamentally believe that the best future for Scotland and indeed the whole of the United Kingdom is to remain within the EU, but within the spirit of reaching consensus. And I do, Madam Deputy Speaker, take objection to people across this House who have suggested that we're not participating in this process. We've tabled 50 amendments, which myself and colleagues are going to speak to now, and that is indeed uh, our involvement in the process. And the First Minister of Scotland was very clear that she was laying out a number of options. And the ball is absolutely in the Prime Minister's court. Yes, I shall. In retrospect, does the Honourable Lady regret the SNP peddling the myth during the Brexit campaign that somehow Scotland alone could remain within the EU without any of the sanctions in the Lisbon Treaty, joining the single currency, joining the euro, etc. Does she regret actually proposing that to the Scottish people as a fact rather than as fiction, which is what it was? <laughs> I'm grateful to the honourable gentleman for his uh, intervention. The only mispeddled in the independence well, referendum from Scotland came from his friends in the Conservative yeah, yeah, Party yeah, yeah, and those yeah, 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 in the Labour yeah, Party. Yeah, those are where the miss came from. I'm grateful to him for reminding the House and indeed all of those watching that that is precisely the case. Uh, the uh, First Minister of Scotland has laid out, as I said, a number of options uh, in, in, included in Scotland's uh, paper that I know my colleagues will refer to. But I would also like to remind uh, members across this House in advance of the independence referendum, the Scottish Government produced a 670-page document called Scotland's Future. And we knew then and know now that we can make a success of an independent Scotland. Compare and contrast that to page, page 65 of the so-called white paper, 
where this government is already talking about failure, including passing legislation as necessary to mitigate the effects of failing to reach a deal, doesn't instil much confidence in anybody. Specifically in relation to the clauses now, Madam Deputy Speaker, if accepted, new clause 26, the teamwork clause, would mean that Article 50 would not be triggered until this Team UK approach was agreed by each individual member of the team. Isn't that what the Prime Minister said? On that basis, I'd be hoping that we'll have support across the House for that amendment. New clause 139 requires a substantive vote. Substantive. Yes, I will. Honourable Lady, for giving way, could she just clarify, would new clause 26 effectively give the First Minister of Scotland, if she refused to agree, a veto over the exercise of Article 50? Yeah. 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 Honourable Member for his interventions, which are always astute, and I will refer him to the wording, where it refers specifically to a UK-wide approach to and objectives for the UK negotiations. Those are the Prime Minister's words. Yeah. Yeah. Moving to clause 139. This requires a substantive vote on this matter to be held in each of the devolved parliaments prior to Article 50 being invoked, further strengthening the democratic mandate for this action. New Clause 144 sets out a mechanism to ensure that all devolved administrations will have direct representation in negotiations on leaving the EU, enabling the negotiating team to have expert input from each constituent part of the UK. And given what we've seen so far, this House is indeed, and this government is indeed, in need of some expert input. Yeah. Following this, new clause 145 would set in legislation what we already understand to be possible and deliverable. And that's a negotiation of a differentiated agreement for Scotland to, remit, to retain its vital access to the single market by remaining part of the EEA. Amendment 46 further strengthens the role of the devolved parliaments in this process while Amendment 55 would specifically ensure that the people of Northern Ireland are represented in this process by the newly elected Northern Ireland Executive following the upcoming election. Amendment 66 to ensure a formal cross-border discussion on the Government's proposal to maintain a frictionless land border with Ireland. And lastly, Amendment 63 would give the Scottish Parliament, Northern Ireland Assembly and Welsh Assembly members the same opportunity to hear the Prime Minister address them on Brexit as she afforded to members of the US Congress who attended the Republican Party away day in Philadelphia last month. And I think that's only fair, Madam Deputy Speaker. We know from last week's brief white paper that the Government still believe there should be a special deal for Northern Ireland in our negotiations with the EU. A frictionless border between the UK and Ireland remains their priority. We also know that the UK car industry in the City of London, to which my honourable friend has already alluded, have also been singled out to merit special attention in these negotiations. It is becoming clearer with each passing day that the Government will be willing to pay through the nose to secure a special arrangement where this is in their political or economic interests. Yeah, 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 yeah. The Scottish Government... Yes? I thank my honourable friend for giving way, and I do hope... Oh, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> thank my honourable friend for giving way, and I do hope she's going to press all of these amendments to vote, because everyone here loves trooping through the lobbies and exercising our parliamentary sovereignty. <laughs> but does she agree that a differentiated deal for uh, Scotland and Scotland retaining its access to the single market would actually be of benefit to the rest of the United Kingdom. Yep. They're so keen to retain a land border with the EU in the island of Ireland. Why wouldn't they want a land border on the actual island of, of Great Britain so that England could trade over the land border into the single market in Scotland? Yeah. As usual, my honourable friend makes very salient comments, although I suspect they will fall on deaf ears, and we know what the result of that might well be. The Scottish Government have been clear that they are willing to make fundamental compromises compromises to ensure we can agree a UK-wide approach. The Scottish Government's white paper, Scotland's Place in Europe, sets out a series of options that could be taken, could be taken if this House so wishes to protect the precious union they talk so often about. Could be taken to protect Scotland's political, social and economic interests in Europe whilst also remaining part of the United Kingdom. Now it's time for this Whitehall government to start to treat Scotland seriously and with respect. We know that such a differentiated deal is possible. Only yesterday, and I'm delighted that the Secretary of State for Scotland is in his place, said during an interview on BBC, well, not much about anything in particular, but what we did get from that interview was that it's not impossible, not impossible, to have a differentiated deal for the constituent parts of the UK. Now, the amendments to the SNP are brought forward today set out a framework for us to work together in the interests of Scotland to deliver this. 
We welcome the UK Government's own white paper, which acknowledges the role of the Joint Ministerial Committee and states that it is in place to seek to agree a UK approach to and objectives for negotiations. I refer the Honourable Gentleman across to Clause NC26, the Prime Minister's words. But it, wasn't simply, uh, but it simply wasn't acceptable for the Prime Minister to seem to dismiss the Scottish Government's plan out of hand at a speech in Lancaster House before the GMC had even met to discuss it. Now, the SNP doesn't believe that involving the devolved in administrations ends with the JMC. We want to see real, tangible efforts to develop a proposal acceptable to all of the UK, not just a toothless talking shop. And that's why we've tabled an amendment calling for the devolved administrations to have direct representation in the negotiations as we come to an agreed UK-wide deal. Tomorrow, the Scottish Parliament will vote on the triggering of Article 50. The Prime Minister should respect that outcome. We also believe that the Prime Minister... Yes, I will. The Honourable Lady talks about the Prime Minister respecting the decision. Will she respect the decision of the Supreme Court, no. the unanimous decision of the Supreme Court, that the Prime Minister can decide and that this is the place where we can decide for the whole of the United Kingdom? Uh, the Honourable Gentleman has already made this intervention and was given an answer, but I would also say this to the Honourable Gentleman. Is it his position, is it the Honourable General's position, that the Scotland Act has no meaning, has no value? Is it his position that notwithstanding the terms of the Scotland Act, he is going to ignore the wishes of the Scottish Parliament and the other devolved legislators? No, he's had more than enough time. And I've answered this. I'm not taking any more interventions. I've answered your question. I've answered your question. I have answered your question. Sit down. I've answered your question. I have answered the Honourable Gentleman's question. We also believe that the Prime Minister. We also believe. We also believe that the Prime Minister should not trigger Article 50 before the Northern Irish Assembly election on the 2nd of March has taken place. And there must also be a meeting of the British Irish Council to discuss urgently the immediate effect of the UK's exit from the EU and the Irish border. Because such a deal is not just possible, but it's absolutely essential to Scotland. It's essential in a number of ways. It's essential for Scottish business. The British Chamber of Commerce International Trade Survey is further evidence of the damaging impact that the threat of a Tory hard Brexit is already having on Scottish and UK businesses. It's not rubbish, as uh, Honourable Member says from the sedentary position, unless he wants to rubbish the results of that survey, and indeed with it the British Chamber of Commerce. I suspect not. Hence, he's still in a sedentary position. Published today, it reveals that of the 1,500 businesses surveyed, nearly half, 44 per cent, said that the devaluation of sterling since the EU referendum was having a negative impact on domestic sales margin, while over two-thirds, 68 per cent, expect the fall in the pound to increase their cost base in the coming year, with more than half of companies, 54 per cent, expecting to, increase the price, to have to increase the prices of their products as a result. It is also essential for Scottish exports. Yes, I'll give way. Thank you, Sir Roger. I mean, the Honourable Lady is um, certainly making a very passionate speech, but clearly, if the, if, if, if the pound devalues, it is very, very good for exporters, including exporters in Scotland. There's two sides to that coin. Grateful, grateful as ever, for his recognition of a passionate speech. I wish you would pay more attention to the words I'm using whilst delivering this passionate speech. And at the same time, is it the government's, Tory government's policy to continue with the devalued pound? Is that your vision for, for the economy of the United Kingdom? That's my answer to that question. In relation to Scottish... In relation to Scottish exports, in relation to Scottish, I'm not going to give way just now, if you don't mind. In relation to Scottish exports, new figures published by the think tank Centre for Cities last weekend have shown just how vital the EU single market is for Scotland's four largest cities. The total exports to the EU from Aberdeen, Dundee, Edinburgh, and Glasgow alone totalling nearly seven billion pounds. The report also said that 61% of Aberdeen's exports go to the EU, showing the importance of that export market to Scotland. And it's also essential to maintain Scotland's skilled workforce. I'm not going to give weight just now, if you'll allow me a few more minutes just to make some progress. 
This morning, the Hollywood, Hollywood Cross-Party Europe Committee published its latest report on Brexit, where it recommended a, dis- a bespoke Scottish immigration system, almost on cue, I believe, for memory, this was something uh, propagated by someone on the government benches in the campaign. We now know that that campaign, as a campaign against Scottish independence, was prepared was to true. say anything to win the day and leave the rest of us to pick up the consequences. These findings were based on extensive expert evidence heard by the committee, which detailed the demographic crisis Scotland would face without its EU citizens. And it's also essential, Madam Deputy Speaker, for vital interests such as the Scotting fishing industry. I thank the member for giving way. I was actually listening very carefully to the points that the member made with regards to Northern Ireland. If I heard her right, she indicated that until there is a new Northern Ireland executive established, then the government should not trigger Article 50. Now, Northern Ireland is at a very difficult crossroads at the present time. If no executive is ultimately established after March the 3rd, is, does a member seriously believe that the whole of the United Kingdom should be held to ransom until that conundrum is resolved? I'm grateful to the, to the Honourable Gentleman for his point, uh, uh, which I understand, but I would also say. Why is the whole of the United Kingdom being held to ransom by some random date selected by the Prime Minister with no view to the consequences for the whole of the country and so seeking that date? That is the date to which we are requiring to work just because it came off on a whim. Uh, It is essential, as I said, for the fishing industry. And I will mention the fishing industry because for too long that industry has been ignored by this government that has not stood up for them in Europe. And the white paper seems to confirm the worst fears for our fishermen, who now believe that without a specific Scottish deal, the interests will be negotiated away once again as they have been so before. Now it is clear that a differentiated deal for the constituent parts of the UK is optimal, it is deliverable and it is essential to protecting our interests. Now it is time, time for the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom to keep her promises, promises. to Scotland. As she said, a UK approach for all of Team UK. But be under no illusions. My colleagues and I were elected by our constituents to stand up for Scotland, and that is exactly what we will do. One way or another, Scotland's interests will be protected. The amendments we propose today would strengthen the UK's future negotiating position with the EU and would provide a framework to serve the best interests of its constituent parts. These proposals crystallise in legislative specifics the grand platitudes that the Prime Minister and others have spouted about Scotland's place in the UK and our role in this process. Yes, I shall. The Honourable Lady referred earlier to the impact of the pound being devalued. Could you tell us which currency in an independent Scotland we would have? Would it be the pound, the euro or some other currency of her or the member for Gordon's invention? Very very, very grateful grateful to the uh, Honourable Gentleman uh, for his his, uh, intervention. And indeed, as my colleagues are saying, again from a sedentary position, uh, the Honourable Gentleman does not believe in expert opinion anyway. But perhaps the Honourable Gentleman will agree, and the fact that he mentions another independence referendum speaks to the fact that the question that was posed to the people of Scotland in 2014 about that United Kingdom is not the same United Kingdom that existed then. And as we will put forward, if it, I mean, of course it is in, within the gift of the government, it is in the gift of members across this House to agree to these proposals, which are a compromised position, if he does not want another independence referendum. But if we do have one, the arguments will be put forward to the people of Scotland to make that decision. They give the government an opportunity to put their money where their mouth is when it comes to respecting Scotland and the devolution process. The UK, Madam Deputy Speaker, the UK is either, well, the UK quite simply is either a country which respects all of its constituent parts or it isn't. It's as simple a question as that. And this government today will need to decide one way or the other. And we're waiting for our answer and indeed we are ready to respond. But if the UK government decides to turn its back on the Scottish Government, 
the Scottish Parliament, voters in Scotland will be left under no illusion as to how this Government intends to deal with Scottish interests in future negotiations. And if the Scottish people can no longer trust the UK Government to act in its interests, it will be a matter for the people of Scotland to decide the best way to rectify this unsatisfactory situation and increasingly disunited Kingdom. Yeah.